The incoming president, Dr. Ratcliffe, has very kindly permitted me to stay here to introduce our speaker for today. And I have very great pleasure indeed in welcoming Professor Katie Flanagan. Uh, hardly needs uh, an introduction. Uh, a lady that's been intimately involved with the many aspects of this pandemic. And uh, we must congratulate you, Katie, on your president, uh, your president elect of the Australian Society for Infectious Diseases. Yes, 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 yes. She's a world renowned clinician scientist, uh, head of the infectious diseases at our Launceston General Hospital and professor at UTAS, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology and Monash Universities. She's on, she was, and still is at the moment, honorary secretary of the Australian Society of Infectious Diseases. But as you can see, she's about to become the president and she chairs their vaccination special interest group, which I think is a special interest to us all at the moment, isn't it? Um, and is a member uh, of the Australian Technical Advisory Group on uh, Immunisation um, and chairs their COVID-19 vaccine utilisation and prioritisation subgroup. She's going to talk about the platform technologies being used to design the vaccine, uh, candidates in preclinical and uh, clinical trials and phase three trial efficacy results. She'll discuss the progress globally with the vaccine rollout and the Australian strategy and program in more detail. And she'll also conclude with discussing next generation vaccines against those emerging SARS CoV 2 variants. So, once again, my very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Katie Flanagan. So thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk today. It's really such a pleasure to be able to give a talk in person. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the Palawa people as the original and traditional custodians of the land on which we're all meeting today and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Can you not hear me very well? Just maybe put this up a tad. Okay, I hope that's a little better. Um, the title is just slightly different on my talk, which is about to emerge. Um, but essentially, obviously, I'm going to talk about the COVID-19 vaccines and really try and get you to understand what's out there in the pipeline, how these vaccines work, what do you need to know, what do you need to understand, what, how safe are they, these clinical trials have been done very quickly. What does that mean in terms of safety? And just walk you through some of these issues. These are some of my declarations. The most important one being that I am on a target and advising on the COVID vaccine program, but I'm going to talk about my own opinions, not necessarily those of a target. I think you've already heard what this talk's going to be about. So we'll skip over that slide and just get to the global situation at the moment. <laughs> So there's 126 million documented cases so far, but we think that that's probably um, a gross underestimate, many more cases and probably four times that number already in the world and almost 3 million deaths now. Um, and that number unfortunately is increasing. There's more than 260 candidate vaccines in the pipeline, which is absolutely extraordinary when you think that 14 months ago, we barely knew anything about this virus. And this is just unprecedented for any other disease, this number of vaccines coming through the pipeline so quickly. And I think what's even more amazing is that 83 of them are already in clinical trials. So that's human clinical trials. They've gone through their preclinical testing, often in animal models, often with challenges against the virus. And then they get into doing um, the clinical trials. And clinical trials go through a number of phases. They start with phase one 
where you just do in a small number of people safety and immunogenicity and check that they are safe and that they're stimulating the kind of immune response you want. Then you go into phase two where you just ramp up the safety and immunogenicity to hundreds of people, often up to around a thousand. And then you advance to phase three clinical trials. And in phase three, you are going to test efficacy and see if this vaccine protects against the disease you're trying to protect against. Now, phase three normally occurs in thousands of people, but for COVID-19 vaccines, it's being done in tens of thousands of people for each of the different vaccines coming through. And that again is testament to the fact that these vaccines are going through the correct pipeline and really very robust testing before getting licensed for use. So this diagram here is from a paper of mine um, from earlier this year, just summarizing the different approaches that are being taken to develop these vaccines. On the left hand side, you can see conventional approaches and all of the old conventional approaches are being tested. And I'm going to walk you through each of those approaches so that you understand how the vaccines made using those different approaches. So at the top, you've got protein subunit vaccines. And this is where you take bits of the um, vi virus and you mix it in with an adjuvant and inject it into the person to stimulate an immune response against those proteins. Underneath that, you've got virus-like particles, and we'll talk about how they're constructed. Um, examples of virus-like particle vaccines are the HPV vaccine, the human papillomavirus one, and the hepatitis B vaccine. And then at the bottom, we've got the whole viral vaccines. Now, they include the attenuated live viruses, just like the original smallpox vaccine, measles vaccine, yellow fever vaccine. They're all using live viruses. And what they do there is they attenuate the virus so it doesn't cause full-blown disease, but it causes a mild form of the illness. And then below that, we've got inactivated virus. So the whole virus is inactivated, can't multiply, but we'll, you'll get an immune response against it. But what I think has been very exciting is the other side. So none of these approaches had ever been licensed before for use in humans. So at the top, we've got nucleic acid. They can be either using DNA or RNA, and we'll talk more about those in a moment. And underneath, we've got the viral vector vaccines, and they can either use a viral vector to carry the gene of interest into the host, either non-replicating viral vectors or ones that are able to replicate in vivo. So starting with the whole virus vaccines, on the left here, we've got the live vaccines and on the right, the inactivated vaccines. And you can see in the diagram, as I was explaining, it's either an attenuated virus or it's fully inactivated, but it's still the whole virus. So the good thing about these is they, they these are traditional methods. We've got all the standard regulatory pipelines for using these kind of methods, and we know how to make these on the large scale. Um, and they do tend to elicit quite broad immunity because you're using whole virus, not single proteins. But with the live vaccines, we've got the problem they take a very long time to make because it's quite hard to be truly sure you've got a fully attenuated virus and that it's going to be safe. Um, and also they can't be used in people with immunocompromised or pregnant women. They can sometimes revert to wild type and cause disseminated disease. And that occurs with polio and hence vaccine associated paralytic polio and can occur with BCG, for example. Um, and often they require a cold change storage. If you use an inactivated one, they're not as immunogenic and therefore they often need multiple doses and they often also need to, to um, have an adjuvant, which in the past traditionally has been aluminium adjuvants. For the protein and peptide vaccines, as I said, you take bits of protein or you can take just some of the peptides, so not even the whole protein, but just some of the amino acids strung together, mix with adjuvant, and, um, and then you get your immune response that way. So that protein gets taken up by the cells and presented to your immune system as foreign. Again, a very traditional methodology, easy to make and safe in immunocompromised people, but again has the problem of not being terribly immunogenic, so you often have to have multiple doses, require an adjuvant, um, and um, one of the other issues is that the protein confirmation is absolutely critical, because if you don't get the right confirmation, the antibodies that you make might be non-neutralizing, so don't actually neutralize the virus, and in some cases they can even enhance disease. So you've really got to get that right, and that can be quite tricky sometimes. And also, if you're just using bits of proteins, 
that um, your T cells, which are also part of the components of the immune response, um, can't actually be stimulated unless you've got the right bits. And that is very variable over the world, which bits of um, protein you can, your T cells can respond to. It depends on what's called your HLA type. So now moving on to the virus-like particles. Oh, it's not moving. Let's see, it hasn't moved here, but it's moving on my side. Nope. Just to get the tech person. Okay, so I'll just start talking about it anyway. So the virus-like particles, these are really clever because what you do is you get a bacteria or you get a yeast or something to express the protein. And then that protein will self-assemble into particles. And um, those particles can be quite immunogenic, um, but the only problem with those virus-like particle vaccines is they're quite unstable. And so um, they do actually have to, how are we doing? Yeah, there we go. So you can see at the bottom here, you've got the expression of the proteins and then they self-assemble into particles. So these are, um, they're very simple and safe to make. They don't contain any genetic material. They just contain like the outer side and look very much like the virus without the genes. And they're very flexible to make and elicit quite broad ranging immunity. But it really depends on which kind of expression system you use, how easy and um, cheap they are to make. And some systems are more difficult than others. They're often quite impure when they're first made and have to be purified. And it can be quite challenging to produce these large scale. Having said that, they are certainly one of the approaches people are taking. Now, everyone would have heard about viral vector vaccines. I think until six months ago, nobody would have even heard of a chimpanzee adenovirus, but this is obviously what the Oxford vaccine is based on. But there are a number of other candidates that are um, using the viral vector approach. Now, all the ones that are in clinical trials at the moment are using the non-replicating viral vectors. And essentially these ve viral vectors are just used as a vehicle, just like a virus-like particle really, or any of these things to just get the gene into the host cell. So these viral, the non-replicating ones are completely replication deficient, but you can also have replicating viral vectors, which will repeat, reproduce inside the human, but they won't cause significant disease. So you can see you've got your coronavirus spike gene sitting on both of these um, virus-like particles. They get into the cell and then they take over the host machinery to make that protein and stimulate an immune response. They're very safe and well tolerated, and you can often get very good protein expression and therefore really good immunogenicity, even with single doses. Um, but scale up of these takes time. And that's very obvious in Australia because we've got our own manufacturing onshore at the CSL laboratories in Melbourne, but that, um, that scale up is actually taking quite a bit of time. Although we're hoping in the coming week or so, we should start getting a million doses a week out of that facility. Um, and one of the other issues is that you can produce antibodies against the vector, and many people have naturally acquired immunity to adenoviruses, which will hamper the immune response to a certain extent. And that's still not really been worked out how much is that's going to be a problem, but it was one of the rationales for the chimpanzee adenovirus being used by Oxford, because you shouldn't have pre-existing immunity to that one. Having said that, once you've had one dose, you should start to get some immunity to it. And I have challenged AstraZeneca on this a number of times. Times, but they haven't actually answered whether they've looked at anti-vector immunity not, or not. And this is the other type of vaccine that people are very interested in, because obviously we have the Pfizer vaccine here in Australia, and this is an RNA vaccine, and these are very novel vaccines as well. I think one of the biggest questions people have is whether they can actually integrate into the host genome. Because people hear that they're nucleic acid and they get very nervous about that, particularly young pregnant women or women that are considering childbirth, they think that this might alter their DNA. So the thing to say is the RNA categorically cannot get into the cell. It can't integrate into the host genome. It's actually biologically impossible because it, needs, it hasn't got the right um, enzymes to cross into the nucleus. And then it can't turn into DNA because humans don't have a reverse transcriptase. So it's just physically not possible. The other thing is RNA is very, very unstable. If there was RNA in a tube in front of me, I've only got to just touch the side of the tube and all that RNA will be destroyed within a very short time. 
And once the RNA gets into the cell, it works in the cytoplasm to use the host machinery again to make the proteins and express the proteins and get an immune response. Once it's in the cell, it gets broken down and there's a very regulated process in the cell for RNA breakdown. So it lasts there for maybe a couple of days. There's two different types. There's either non-replicating RNA vaccines, and that's what the Pfizer one and the Moderna one is. But you can also get replicating mRNA, which actually carries a gene to make itself replicate, and then you get massive protein um, expression. Although it's interesting because when BioNTech was testing different vaccines to choose the one that candidate they were going to choose, they did actually have a, a replicate self-amplifying or replicating one as well, but they didn't choose that one because it had a higher adverse event profile. And they went for the one that which we all know of now. So these vaccines are very easy to design and very quick to make. You can get a sequence of a virus and four weeks later have a vaccine made and ready to go. So this is very good news if we're going to have to make new variants for these um, viruses, new variant um, vaccines. And the immune response tends to be very robust. But as I said before, it's very, very unstable. And so the RNA has to be packaged somehow. And what you saw in that previous figure is it was covered in something which we call a lipid nanoparticle. It's a bit like a cell membrane, but it's just lipids that have all joined together and protect the RNA inside. And that's the reason that they often need ultra low temperature storage as well. Um, and certainly, as I say, they can be quite unstable. They also stimulate inside the cell and can cause quite an um, uh, immunogenic response, but also quite an, um, a lot of reactogenicity. And we're seeing that with these vaccines that a lot of people are getting local and systemic reactions such as headache, fever, myalgia, um, and an aching arm. And then finally, the DNA vaccines, very like the RNA vaccines in that you're carrying the, the gene into the cell, but this time it is DNA, not RNA, which is obviously what we all carry in our cells. And um, the gene is carried on what we call a plasmid, or sometimes it's coated onto gold nanoparticles and injected that way. If you inject it deep into the muscle, it will enter the myocytes, but it's not very efficient. And so what they often do is they try and find ways to get it administered intradermally. And what you can see here on the right-hand side are a couple of the kind of devices that are used to do that. The one at the bottom actually breaks down the pores in the cell. It's called an electroporation device, and that allows the DNA to enter. And that's if you're giving an intradermal injection. So that's, I guess, a bit of a complication with those vaccines, just trying to get really good immunogenicity, because on the whole, they're not terribly immunogenic. So that's all the different vaccines that I wanted to tell you about. There are a couple of different bacterial vector vaccines, but they're not really very popular approaches. And what I've summarized here is those that number across all those different platforms in preclinical trials and those in clinical trials. And I guess one of the main things to point out is the very popular approach is the protein and peptides. The old traditional methodology is being used for 96 of these vaccines and developments, so well over a third. But if you look across all the other approaches, there are all still a lot of candidates coming through using all those technologies we've just discussed, with the exception of live attenuated viruses, just one in clinical trials and two coming through. And I, I think that's because of those complications. And that's very old technology, quite dirty vaccines, but they tend to be very immunogenic with long lasting immunity. Of all of the candidates coming through, the majority are two dose schedules. So you can see here 62%, but different times. So either Norton 14 days or 28 days or 21 days. Although the AstraZeneca, as we know, is now recommended at 12 weeks. And I'll explain why later. Few, a few of them are single dose and obviously single dose would be much better for us. And then maybe though, once we've had our two doses, we may only need boosters in the future. We just don't know yet. The majority are given intramuscularly, but there are um, some intradermal and subcutaneous ones. And there are a couple of oral candidates already in clinical trials, which I think is very exciting if you could take a pill to get your coronavirus immunity. And this is what's truly remarkable is that 24 candidates are already in phase three or phase four trials. Now, phase four is when they've already been licensed and you carry on doing the safety monitoring, which is now what's happening with all of those that have been given licensure.
And I've just listed all of those that have gone through to those efficacy trials just to demonstrate that, um, again, it's across all of those platforms that we've got them already moving into um, efficacy trials. And I've also highlighted in bold the four vaccines that are going through consideration by the TGA. Three of those were pre-purchased already by the TGA prior to getting any efficacy data. And one of them is going through a provisional determination with the TGA, but that's the Janssen one. But they haven't made any purchase agreement on that one. But I think what it does demonstrate is that the Australian program was definitely ahead of the game because they chose and pre-purchased these vaccines before we had any efficacy data. Now they had all those 260 odd candidates to choose from and they managed to pick three that are front runners, all with really good efficacy, all, um, all across three different platforms. And that's really helpful because some people just may not be able to have a certain vaccine using a certain platform. So having the three tools, all of these ones in the future in the toolbox, I think is going to be really helpful for us. And this is a very busy slide, but the bits I want to point to, point to you really are the bits in red. Um, and these are interim phase three trial results. So what happened was towards the end of last year, as COVID was sweeping through the world and more and more people dying and more and more hospitals overwhelmed, the aim was at a certain point to stop and analyze the phase three studies prior to them actually completing because they needed to see, was there a signal these vaccines were working? Now, all across the world, we were hoping we might get 50% efficacy or around that. And that was the aim and that would have been sufficient to license a vaccine provisionally. But we have been absolutely amazed at the level of efficacy that we're looking at for these vaccines. When you bear in mind that flu vaccine is usually 50 to 60% efficacious at best. So at the top two, we've got the RNA vaccines, both sitting at around 95% efficacy against symptomatic disease from seven days after dose two. Importantly for Pfizer, they showed the same efficacy in those over 65. Often when you're older, you don't respond as well to vaccines, but these seem to be fine. They are also consistent across gender, race, ethnicity, and people with a whole host of stable comorbidities, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Um, then if you go down to the chimp adenovirus and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, they are more like 70% efficacy. But what I've pointed out with um, the um, adenovirus, uh, chimp adenovirus vaccine is if you look at six, less than um, six weeks between doses, the efficacy is only around 55%. But once you take it out to 12 weeks, the efficacy is sitting at around 80%. And that is why Atagi made the recommendation, and it was my group that grew, drew up those clinical guidelines, that we want the dose given 12 weeks apart. You can have it closer, but you won't get as good efficacy. So you're better off waiting and just getting it at the more uh, around the 12 week mark, and you should be getting around 80% efficacy against clinical disease. What's really important though, is efficacy against hospitalization and severe disease is 100% with that vaccine. Actually, it wasn't with Pfizer because Pfizer had one severe case in their vaccine recipients. So it's, you've got to remember these efficacy data are preliminary, and they're not really comparable. They're different populations and they are different situations. And we'll talk about that a little more in a moment. The Russian vaccine, which is also an adenovirus one, a human one, they use two different adenoviruses. They reckon they had 92% efficacy even after one dose, which is quite surprising when you compare to the other adenoviruses. But anyway, that's what the data show. And then at the bottom, the um, Novavax vaccine. So that's the protein one. It's the spike protein with a special adjuvant called Matrix M. <laughs> Another one that we um, are going to have in Australia in the coming months, around 90% efficacy. Originally with the AstraZeneca, we were very worried that we didn't have good data for those over 65 years of age. And we felt that, um, you know, it was quite a difficult call whether we could recommend it in older people. But we decided to, in the end, after some conversations with our Canadian and British colleagues, and luckily the USA trial um, did a preliminary analysis of their data last week and have released an 80% efficacy in those over 65. So similarly, it seems to be performing just as well in the older people. So we're very relieved about that. 
And I should just warn you, these are preliminary data. Everybody's got hung up on, is AstraZeneca a rubbish vaccine? Is Pfizer the one you want? No, they are both fantastic vaccines, both of them. So try not to get caught up in that argument. I think if you're going to get either offered to you, then you're very fortunate. But we don't know how long protection is going to last. And we do know that a lot of priority populations were not included in the trials, such as pregnant women and severely immunocompromised people. Um, and we don't know that much about disease transmission, but we're starting to see that they do decrease the amount of virus you have, the amount of time you're ill with virus, and that there will be a decrease in transmission, which we assumed would be the case, but we just didn't have the data. And real world efficacy isn't always the same as what you see in clinical trials. And I'm going to show you that because that is bearing out at the moment. I also mentioned their rare side effects may be missed, and I think that's also playing out in, in the media as well. It's quite clear that in very, very rare occasions, AstraZeneca seems to be associated with this weird central um, venous sinus thrombosis in, with low platelet count. And it looks like it's real, um, but that's being heavily investigated at the moment. But it, if, even if it is, it's a one in a million event and it's still recommended to get the vaccine. But there will be a few people in whom vaccination will be contraindicated. And there has been a, a statement released by Targi last week on that. So from a worldwide point of view, nine of these vaccines are now being rolled out throughout the world. Two RNA vaccines, three viral vectors, three inactivated virus vaccines and the one protein vaccine. And more than 518 million doses as of yesterday have been given um, across 140 countries in the world. Bearing in mind, there's only 55 countries left that aren't rolling out the vaccine. So this is just unbelievable. More than, more than 13 million doses are being, being given every single day to people at the moment. So when you worry about safety, every country is watching their safety data. The signals are pretty good and pretty low for all of these vaccines. Although we don't know that much about the three um, inactivated vaccines, they're all being rolled out in China um, and they're not really releasing much data. Um, but even with that sort of rate, it's still going to take many years to cover 75% of the world's population. I thought I'd just give you an indication of, of some of the world figures. So at the top here, we've got China. Now they were the very first to start rolling out in June last year. That was in the absence of any efficacy data. They just decided to go ahead. Fortunately, some of their vaccines have come up with fairly reasonable efficacy, although one of them is really only around 50%, so not the best. UK is doing a really good job. 44% of their populations now had um, one dose. And I should just point it out that although the Chinese have got 91 million doses out, um, that's a very small proportion of the Chinese population. So it's going to take them an awful long time to get through their population. USA obviously is doing well. 27% have had single dose. And Israel's definitely the front runner with 58%. Although, as I say, UK seems to be catching up. Canada and France sitting at around 11%. And I'm not sure why that Australian flag is flashing. That's really bizarre. Um, anyhow, um, we're obviously way behind, um, but we've only just started um, this month. Um, 357,000 doses given less than 1% of our population, but clearly it's happening. And um, we've got two great vaccines that are working. So this is what I was talking about real world efficacy. So the top study is the most important one. In Scotland, more than five and a half million people followed up prospectively after they got their first dose of either AstraZeneca or Pfizer vaccine. And what you can see is against hospitalization. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you get a mild flu-like illness from COVID, you're not going to get 100% protection. What you don't want to get is you don't want to end up in hospital and you don't want to die of it because then our hospitals won't be overwhelmed and you'll be able to cope and carry on your life. So, I mean, obviously we would rather people not get it at all, but this is, this is at the moment the, the most important thing. So the AstraZeneca protected 94% against being hospitalized, whereas the Pfizer was 85%. And this is what I'm saying about the real world efficacy. Everyone says AstraZeneca is not a great vaccine. It's actually outperforming Pfizer now. 
when everyone looks at efficacy data for a number of things. So this is really important. And this is why you should be quite happy with what you get. And I don't think this message is coming out very well at the moment. And I really wish people would understand how good the, um, the, Pfizer, the AstraZeneca vaccine actually is. And then the other two studies, they're case control studies. And again, you're seeing around 80% efficacy against hospitalization, 85% against dying. Um, and then at the bottom, again, it's around 80%, but probably AstraZeneca a little better than Pfizer. Against symptomatic disease, probably 60, 70% against actually getting symptomatic disease for either of them. So we're not seeing that 95% that they saw in the clinical trials. And so this is why you've got to bear in mind that, you know, when you roll things out in the real world, it's not the same as, um, as when you do these clinical trials, which are very tightly controlled. So when it comes to the Australian program, this has been a very, very complex space. It has kept me um, very busy for the last six months. Um, a whole series of different people involved in it, but obviously it's a federally run program, which is unusual. It's normally, it's all the jurisdictional immunization committees would just run with the vaccines, but the federal government actually set up a task force and they're the ones that are running the um, whole program. And obviously they're also calling the shots in terms of certain aspects of this program. Um, but there's many um, departments involved. So we've got uh, the, the National Cabinet, obviously, the task force. We've got the Advisory Committee on Vaccines, ATAGI, um, Therapeutics Goods Administration, and then a CITAG, which is a special group that was stood up to actually pick the vaccines um, and to initiate the process, which is unusual because that's normally done by the PBAC. And at the bottom here, there's the three um, ATAGI advisory groups. So ATAGI advises the government on its program. There's the group that I lead, which is the vaccine utilization and prioritization. There was another one on the implementation um, and distribution of the vaccines and another one on safety and evaluation. So you can imagine that one is coming into its own at the moment. Um, and our, all three groups meet with the um, with the government every week um, and with the COVID-19 task force just to coordinate where the program's going. And I can tell you, you know, to do this for the whole country and plan it for the whole country is, has been a phenomenal task, but a very exciting one nevertheless. Right, it's stopped moving again, I'm afraid. Hold on, actually. There we go. Nope. Sorry about this, it's not moving again. But I will just talk. So I've already mentioned this anyway. The next slide is just talking about the Australian government commitment <coughs> to COVID-19 vaccines. And as I said, they had already pre-purchased three of those front runner vaccines, all with absolutely fantastic efficacy. So the Chimp adenovirus AstraZeneca, the Pfizer vaccine, but also Novavax's vaccine as well has been rolled out. The, um, the sad story was the University of Queensland um, vaccine where they had got a spike protein and they had clamped it with what's called a molecular clamp. That was it actually, yeah, that's great, go back. Um, they clamped it with a molecular clamp to hold that spike protein in its normal native form, but they'd use a bit of HIV antigen to do that. And unfortunately, that caused false positive HIV results in a very high proportion of people who got tested across all the different platforms. So it didn't cause HIV, obviously. It just caused an antibody response that could be misconstrued that somebody had HIV. And there was a lot of debate about this as to whether this was acceptable. I have to say my view right away was this is a no-go because... You know, imagine if you travel and somebody does an HIV test and tells you you've got HIV and doesn't understand the vaccine did this. You couldn't roll this out in Africa where they don't have good um, HIV diagnostics. So in the end, unfortunately, that vaccine had to had to be abandoned. The only other one I haven't mentioned is the um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. That's an adenovirus 26. They've got a preliminary determination with the TGA, um, but there's been no um, pre-purchase uh, agreement. And actually, I can't see the government buying it, although they ha I have no idea and no insight into that because we've already purchased enough of two vaccines for our entire population. So unless they want to use it in the region, I'm not sure that we will actually buy it, although who knows? 
And the bottom here, I mentioned the COVAX facility. And for those of you that don't know what that is, that is a global facility that has been set up by um, Gavi, which is the Global Alliance on Vaccines, and by CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which are these two extraordinary organizations who had the foresight to see that really we've got to make sure that everyone in the world gets equitable access. And the idea was to get the richer nations to invest and then they would guarantee a certain amount of vaccine for their population if all of their pre-purchase agreements failed and if there was a vaccine in the facility that they could have, they would get it. But that would they would also have to contribute to the poorer nations of the world getting vaccine. So Australia made a significant contribution to guarantee 50% for our population. They're not going to need to use that allocation. And um, guards, the COVAX facility is going to distribute 2 billion doses of vaccine this year to the poorer nations of the world. And it's already happening all over the world. Many countries are taking up their COVAX um, allotment, which is, is really wonderful. The actual program initial aim is to reduce serious illness and death at the moment and where possible transmission. We have to do that in the initial phase because you're not going to be able to aim for herd immunity right now, particularly since we don't even have vaccines licensed for children at the moment. If you want herd immunity, the kids are going to have to get vaccinated as well. Um, but there are a number of other factors as well. Equity was a very important consideration. Promoting public trust. Um, establishing a national immunization program is going to be one of our aims, and we will do that at Targi in due course. Um, and maintaining the society functioning essential services was also key. Obviously, dependent on vaccine supply, the characteristics and the local epidemiology will also determine what we do. Because I think if there was a sudden outbreak somewhere, like a really bad one or another wave in a major city or in a state, we may actually change the program and divert vaccines there, but um, we're looking at modeling that at the moment and in and, and terms of what impact that might have. And obviously we strongly encourage anyone to take the vaccine, but it's not compulsory. There are a number of priority populations and they're all listed here, but obviously we were very, very keen that those at increased risk of developing severe disease or dying get the vaccine. And the single biggest risk factor is age above absolutely anything else, any type of immunocompromise, any type of comorbidity, being older is the biggest single risk factor, particularly if you're over 80. It's really quite significant. Um, those at increased risk of exposure and onward transmission. So by way of reciprocity, which we think is really important, we really wanted our high frontline healthcare workers and our border, border staff and quarantine staff to get vaccine. And then obviously we've got to think about keeping society functioning. So we've got to make sure all of those services are maintained should we have a wave of COVID come through um, the community. You would have all seen this because I think it's been everywhere and, and anywhere that the government can get attention. So this is um, how they strategized rolling out the vaccine, starting with phase 1A into 1B, 2A, 2B, and basically working through the entire population of Australia. And by the time we get to the phase three, hoping that the vaccines are licensed for children so that we can start rolling out in kids as well. And we're already rolling nicely into 1B at the moment. Um, a lot of the quarantine border staff, frontline healthcare workers and aged care facilities staff and residents have been vaccinated, um, but that's still ongoing while the phase 1B are being um, worked up. In terms of the two vaccines we have, they've got slightly different age indications. So the community is the RNA vaccine, the Pfizer one, that can be given over the age of 16, but the AstraZeneca at the moment only over the age of 18. The dosing is different, community being 21 days apart, but AstraZeneca 12 weeks, as I explained to you why that is. Um, but if you give it earlier, it's not a problem. You don't need extra doses. If you give it a bit late, it's also not a problem at the moment. But we are recommending that you complete the course with the same vaccine, although this may not always be possible. So if you have a severe allergic reaction to the Pfizer vaccine, you may not want another dose. And um, we are now drawing up guidelines that will allow um, different vaccines to be given if it has to be done, because they're all based on the spike protein. So theoretically, they should still boost an immune response, although that hasn't been tested. Um, and it is being tested in clinical trials at the moment. 
I think one of the important things that people want to, to know about is adverse events. And this is from the phase three trials. Um, and important to note the bottom line for all three vaccines, because we haven't got Novavax here yet, but we are likely to get it in the not too distant future. But for all of them, no serious adverse events and not too many grade three. So that's quite high level systemic or local adverse events but a very, very high level of reactogenicity and systemic events such as fatigue, headache, myalgia, and pain as well. With the community vaccine, um, the adverse events are much higher with your second dose. The same with the Novavax, whereas with AstraZeneca, it's the other way. Lots of adverse events with dose one, less with dose two. If you're older, you're less likely to have adverse events. And I've seen the same with flu vaccine and DTP vaccine. So if you're older, you don't tend to get such a bad reaction. You can't have it if you have anaphylaxis, either to a previous dose or a component. If you know that you've got allergy to PEG, for example, very, very rare PEG allergy, and it's in lots of things. But if you do have, you can't have the, um, the Pfizer vaccine. In terms of flu vaccine, you're all going to need to get two doses of a COVID vaccine plus a dose of flu vaccine this year. And at the moment, the recommended recommendation is to space them two weeks apart. That's actually because of lack of data and programmatically is quite difficult. And eventually we're likely to reduce that. And probably in the end, you'll get your flu vaccine with your COVID vaccine if we end up having to give regular um, jabs. But at the moment, it's a two week interval. But if they are given together, it's not a big deal. We don't think it would actually affect the immunogenicity. You're just more likely to have side effects and you can reduce that interval if there really is a compelling need to do so. If you've got immunocompromised, you absolutely need the vaccine because you're more likely to get severe disease and there's no theoretical risks, but likely the vaccine won't be as immunogenic. And it, both vaccines have been tested in people with stable HIV, but that's the only one. And they give perfectly good protection in those people. It's been a lot of questions around pregnancy and breastfeeding. If you are pregnant, um, although the vaccine is not recommended, it's not contraindicated at all. Again, there are no theoretical safety concerns, but there's a complete lack of data. That said, with the fact that we've got millions of doses now administered throughout the world, tens of thousands of pregnant women have now received these vaccines with no untoward effects. There's a pregnancy registry being kept in America and they're watching these all closely and the same in Europe. Um, and so what we would recommend is deciding, look, if you're high risk for exposure, let's say you're a frontline healthcare worker or your partner, or you work as a border personnel, then it would be quite reasonable to consider having the vaccine. So it's one of those sort of risk benefit things. Breastfeeding women, there's no contraindication. If you're planning a pregnancy, also no reason not to have the vaccine. And like I said, being very old is uh, uh, the highest risk factor there is. And so again, we highly, highly recommend that if you are in this group, that you get the vaccine, even though it may be slightly less immunogenic, but we don't know for sure. Kids can't get the vaccine at all at the moment, but the trials are ongoing and they're, they're really sort of ramping down now to sort of like younger age groups. So in time, we will be offering, offering these vaccines to children. Having said that, there's an ethical issue here because they don't really suffer severe COVID. And then do you want to be giving them? But, you know, I think this is going to be a debate that will happen as and when we get data for children. But some of those young teens, still some of them are dying and getting sick. And also, I mean, we have in America, they've lost a lot of children from COVID, just not as many as older people. And so I think, you know, there's something to think about here. And there are some severe reactions some of these children get sometimes to COVID the whole issue of long COVID where you have ongoing symptoms. So I think, I think ethically we'll probably will be giving as long as we've got a vaccine that we feel is really very safe. If you do get the vaccine and you get fatigue and headache and a bit of fever after the vaccine, then you may not need to do what you would normally have to do and go and get your COVID tests and isolate at home. But you do have to follow whatever the public health guidance is at the time. But if you get respiratory symptoms of any type or loss of taste or loss of smell, they have nothing to do with the vaccine and you absolutely do need to do the normal isolation and COVID testing for yourselves. 
And just coming to the end of my talk now, the new variants. Now, obviously, this virus is mutating all over the world and new variants are popping through all over the place. Um, but the three main ones of interest are the British one, the South African and the Brazilian ones at the moment, um, because they are definitely causing, um, they're much more transmissible and therefore spreading throughout. And they're taking over really in the areas where they've set in. But there's, a, there's hundreds of new variants arriving in India as well, and they're all being watched as variants of concern. But with that in mind, we need to see whether these vaccines work against these variants because they're all mutating their spike protein. And of course, all the vaccines are based on the spike protein. Um, with the Pfizer vaccine, they haven't actually got any data from humans, I think because they did their trials so quickly and efficiently. But they've tested it in vitro, like in the test tube, and they see that um, it doesn't neutralize the South African and Brazilian variants as well. For the Oxford vaccine, fine against the UK variant, but very, very poor performance against the South African variants, around 10% efficacy against getting disease, but still much, much higher efficacy against being hospitalized and dying. So it is still thought worth to keep going with that one. The Novavax vaccine, um, very good efficacy against the UK variant, um, 86%, um, not quite as good against um, as the, against the wild type. But when you get to South Africa, it's sitting more around 60%, but drops to around 50% once you take HIV infected people into account. And there's many people there with poorly controlled HIV. But again, 100% protection against getting severe disease. So we still think these vaccines work against these variants. But of course, we're quite concerned about what might be coming through. And Janssen, again, Fairly good efficacy, um, and particularly against hospitalization with the South Africa variant and probably with the Latin American variants as well. So this is all being monitored very carefully. Novavax is already making its variant vaccines and is going to start testing them next month in humans. So that's going to happen. And the good thing is, because the vaccines have gone through all the regulatory pipelines and testing, you don't need to go right back to the beginning when you make a variant vaccine. You can just get testing it straight away. <coughs> So we got more than 250 vaccines in the pipeline. Some of them are oral. Some of them could be given intranasally through a little um, inject, uh, squirt up the nose, as you can see here. There's a number of new delivery systems. There's new, all kinds of new immune potentiators being tested. So lots and lots of things coming through. And we always knew the first generation vaccines would not be perfect. Um, and many companies, as I said, are already looking at their next generation. I know Oxford is already developing theirs. There are plans to trial, try mixing the vaccines, priming with one and boosting with another. They're already ongoing. And many companies, or Moderna certainly, are looking at combining their vaccine with flu vaccine. So in summary, nine vaccines now rolled out worldwide, more than 13 million doses going into arms every single day all based on um, interim phase three data at the moment. We have new platforms. We've got two fabulous vaccines in Australia and one more in the pipeline. Um, and obviously we've already started now our national vaccination program. And I think we were very lucky to also have time to watch what happened all over the world before we had to start. So then we could see if there were any major safety signals in the millions of other people that have got doses of these vaccines. We know these vaccines are going to need to be modified over time. We also know COVID is not going away. So what we have got to do now is get a path towards it being endemic. We have not many deaths, not many hospitalizations. People are generally immune. And maybe we'll have to keep vaccinating as new variants start circulating around the world so you get a booster against that. But we don't know what this program is going to look like and we don't even know what's going to happen. The priority now is to get two doses into as many people in the world as possible to start moving forward with this virus. But we'll certainly be prepared for more epidemics in the future and um, there is absolutely no doubt there are going to be more epidemics to come. It could be even, you know, any time in the next few years. We just don't know. We've had three coronaviruses that have been very um, nasty jump into humans in the last 20 years. MERS and SARS were both very, had very high fatalities. And thank goodness we didn't have a virus doing this with a 30% mortality because we would have lost many, many, many friends had that happened. 
Um, and we'll just have to wait and see. And on the other side is me getting my Pfizer vaccine a couple of weeks ago, which I was thrilled to be able to sit there and, and know that I'm getting my first boost of immunity. So with that, I'll leave it. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Very much. Uh, if uh, anyone would like to ask questions, if you just put your hand up, David will bring you the portable mic and uh, keep it brief. Thank you for the quality of questions. The two, the two um, mRNA vaccines have different cold temperature requirements. So obviously, the Moderna one is less sensitive than the Pfizer one. Um, are you able to just quickly sketch, sketch why that's the case? Well, quite interestingly, Pfizer's now done a lot more thermostability assessment because obviously they were developing them separately and I guess they never shared what they were doing. And Moderna, I think, had the foresight to do all their stability testing up front and to come with a vaccine that could be kept at minus 20. Turns out that the Pfizer vaccine can also be stored at minus 20 for quite a few weeks. The government now know this and the TGA have released that. Um, but the program's now been all worked around minus 70 freezers so nothing has been done to change the way the program's rolling out because everything's kind of set up quite nicely with Pfizer hubs but that's very encouraging and does mean that we can be looking at, um, at uh, perhaps getting the vaccine to other places more easily um, with, that, with that requirement and the other thing to say is it comes in at minus 70 but the vials are coming up to here in a fridge at sort of fridge temperature anyway, because it is stable for a week or so. I think it's five, five days in the fridge, um, even after it's been defrosted. So it, it, it is, um, so I think they're probably fairly comparable, but I do suspect that in time they'll try and find ways to make them even more stable so that they can just be refrigerated. That will be a plan. Reg Gradually coming around, but I'm not allowed to give this to people. I've just remembered I have to hold it for you because of COVID. Uh, there was some early publicity about smoking and obesity being very strong risk factors for serious disease. It seems to have gone a bit quiet. Was that to prevent uh, sort of tap casting people, or is it still? No, it's, it still stands. Um, obesity, definitely. But a BMI greater than 30 is the one that's supposed to be uh, yeah, associated with a greater risk factor. Smoking and, and chronic lung disease, absolutely. But when you look at those risk factors, but compare them to age, they're nowhere near reaching the significance that age would be. And smoking itself only in as much as it causes other things. So normally we'll associate with cardiovascular or respiratory disease. Smoking per se, um, wouldn't like we wouldn't say if you're a smoker, you're going to be prioritized for vaccination. But if you've got cardiovascular disease or, um, or respiratory disease, severe respiratory disease, then you would be. Um, I'm the president of the Lupus Association and Autoimmune Diseases, and we're waiting to find out which ones we should recommend. But today you said either would be okay. Is yes. that basically it? Yeah, and there are guidelines out there. I think your national organisation has published guidelines. Actually, they're slightly inaccurate, I must say, because I've read them and I meant to get back to them about that. But... Um, only in, in around dosing and things like that. But yes, they're both completely safe likely that there will um, they might be a little less immunogenic depending on what medication people are on for their autoimmune disease and there are some very clear recommendations if you're on an immune checkpoint inhibitor if you're having certain um, injected immunomodulatory um, agents then you don't want to have your vaccine on the same day there are so there's, so there's recommendations but it's the standard recommendations for autoimmune diseases for any vaccine but I ha have got we are writing from a target an actual tool specifically for people with autoimmune disease, which is an um, information guide to try and help them make their decisions around vaccination. And it's in my inbox at the moment, and I will be reading it because they want it back for this week so that we can get that out and published. Um, so I haven't read exactly what it looks like, but we've done one for immunocompromised, but we've done one specifically now for autoimmune diseases. And that will be available on the government website probably in the next couple of weeks. 
Sorry? Oh, absolutely. And so we started, it was a combined thing, but we actually decided to do something specifically for autoimmunity so that that, because there's sort of a, you know, the society and craft groups like to have their own guidelines. And there was, with immunocompromise, it includes people with bone marrow transplants, organ transplants, leukemia, can, you know, other cancers. So it didn't really fit very well. So we, we split it out. Um, my question is, you said that um, in some rare cases that clotting is seems to be associated with low platelets. What about somebody whose brain irradiated and has a disposition to forming TIAs or clots? If it's what yeah, so, would you say with respect to that? Yeah, we've we've so last week we held an emergency meeting with hematologists, neurologists, a number of experts from Atagi and government people. Anyway, it was, a, it was a sort of group where we wanted to look at all of these issues and look at the data. And we've been meeting with all our colleagues around the world to look at their data in great detail and with the TGA, of course. If you have a susceptibility to clotting, let's say you've had DVTs or a pulmonary embolus or a stroke, there is no contraindication. There's only very rare reasons why you would actually say that somebody couldn't have the vaccine. This is the um, AstraZeneca vaccine. If they've had a previous um, central venous sinus thrombosis, then you would say don't. And if they've had heparin induced um, issues, so hip syndrome it's called, where you get thrombosis related to heparin, that's the other reason. And that's in the um, Atagi uh, release that came out, I think it was Thursday morning last week, where that's our recommendation at the moment. In actual fact, um, there's a decreased risk of overall thromboembolism in people receiving the vaccine. So it's actually a lower amount in that group than those that didn't get the vaccine. But it, it's just those very specific groups at the moment. And we're still trying to understand the mechanism, but it looks like an antibody mediated thing, a bit like the heparin induced thrombosis that occurs, this HIT syndrome. So there, that's, that's the, um, the indication, not yeah, the um, contraindications at the moment. A uh, question about antibodies. Are we going to be offered testing to see efficacy of vaccine? Or no. is anybody looking at the population generally in yes. the asymptomatic people yep. to see what the prevalence might be in, say, a poor country somewhere in the world? Yeah, look, there's a lot of work being done looking at seroprevalence. In Australia, there's been some really good seroprevalence studies done as well, coordinated by NCS, the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance. So they've also done one in Tasmania in the Northwest. Um, and I'm part of that study because I'm doing some T cell work on those people as well to try and understand their immunity. In terms of um, antibody testing post-vaccination, of course it's done in all the trials and it will be done in a trial setting if people want to ask specific questions, but there's no plan to do that to check that the vaccine has worked in people, partly because we still don't have a correlate of protection. Now we assume neutralizing antibodies are a correlate, but it's all based on circumstantial data at the moment and, and we don't have a true um, a true correlate at the moment. We also think T cells are important, um, but you know nobody's quite sure what they're meant to look at for T cell responses either. So we wouldn't be doing it routinely, but yeah, those studies are all being done and um, there will be more to look at various scenarios. Let's say you get two different vaccines, for example. I think some work needs to be done in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population because we have no data from that population in terms of immunogenicity, et cetera. So there's, yeah, there will be work to be done. Professor Flanagan, a fantastic presentation of broad brush view of the situation. I was going to ask you about the long consequences that appearing in some patients who have a severe disease, but I think you might have answered it in the, uh, the question before last. So unless you've got anything you want to add about that. Yeah, well, what I would add is about 30% of people or up to 30% might be getting long COVID. And it's really quite concerning the long COVID. Um, because some of these people are sick for months. It looks very much like a sort of ME type thing, you know, chronic fatigue, which you often get with viruses anyway. And we don't understand that the mechanism of this yet because it's a new virus, but some of it's probably central, but I think there's also heart involvement, lung involvement, skin involvement. So there's a lot of work to be done there to understand the immunity of that. Interestingly, people worry that if you had long COVID, you might exacerbate it by vaccination, but it seems the opposite is happening. If you give a vaccine, it seems to be attenuating long COVID symptoms. 
So that's really good news. And I don't know why. Um, having said that, I am working with a group at RMIT and we've designed some studies where we're trying to find out why that might happen immunologically. So we may have some data later in the year. Thanks, David. Thanks very much, Professor Flanagan. Um, Dr. Protosky's studies, uh, his vaccine that's being developed in Flinders, where does that fit into this discussion, please? Yes, yeah, so that's still in early phase development. And um, I think we'll just have to wait and see when they get through to efficacy. Now, they'll obviously have to find somewhere that they can do efficacy trials. We're running to, into some major issues with this now, though because vaccines are being rolled out in all these countries. So you to give a vaccine that you don't know whether it works to see if it protects against getting clinical disease, when you've already got vaccines that you know give 95, 80, 90% protection is very tricky. Um, and if somebody gets it in the trial and then dies of the disease because they got that vaccine, I, it's, so they're running into problems now in terms of you know those front runner, people that got their vaccines out there into the big trials, tens of thousands of people are all able to start um, licensing them, but these other people are, are going to run into issues. And for that reason, human challenge models are now being developed where you actually challenge people with the virus, healthy people, and see if the vaccine protects. And that's being done in London at the moment or being developed and WHO was setting up a framework for doing this. Now this was always on the table anyway, as something that might be done. I still have deep concerns about that because even if you give a young fit person who's unlikely to get severe disease, one, they can get long COVID and two, some of them do die <laughs> or get severe disease. And you don't can't always predict that. But I guess they'll just give a very low viral dosage and um, they'll they'll really control how they do it. And I'm sure it'll be very carefully thought through. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's still early phase development and way behind any of these. Um, no indication that the government have done any pre-purchase, nothing, nowhere near getting to apply to the TGA. So I think that's, that'll be a long way coming. Um, there's a number of other vaccines being tested in Australia. There's about five others. There's an oral one, oral DNA vaccine being tested actually, which is quite interesting. Um, and that's based on the spike protein. So they'll test them for safety and immunogenicity I guess if we get a correlative protection, let's say we find that neutralizing antibodies absolutely definitely protect, then you might be able to use that correlate to justify using your vaccine as opposed to another one. So we'll see. Um, and there's all there's these other, you know, 200 odd in the pipeline. They're going to have to go somewhere, but I can guarantee numerous of those will drop out because that's the normal situation with vaccine development. Only a very small number actually make it through to full licensure. And even of all of these, they're only provisionally licensed all over the world. And we don't know if all of them will end up fully licensed. Something may happen, which actually stops one of them and it gets withdrawn from the market completely. It could have been the AstraZeneca one based on this clotting um, issue, but that doesn't seem to be a strong enough concern or signal at the moment, but we're just watching and waiting and monitoring everywhere. Um, if you have a number of allergies, <laughs> like I'm not saying one or two, I'm saying maybe a dozen um, or more, um, which vaccine would you say would be safer? Would the AstraZeneca be safer as far as any uh, side effects and other things might be concerning? Yes, so initially when we started seeing that high anaphylaxis signal with the Pfizer vaccine in the world, the recommendation was that they are, anyone with a whole string of allergies be very carefully watched. And we still um, hold with that. So if you've had multiple anaphylaxis episodes to other drugs, but particularly other vaccines, or you're a highly highly allergic person. So not if, if you've got anaphylaxis to wasp stings or if you've got anaphylaxis to peanuts, that is not a reason for any special recommendation. But if you are one of these people, then yes, we, we're a little bit more concerned about the Pfizer because it's about one in 200,000 with anaphylaxis. Um, AstraZeneca is normal at one in a million with anaphylaxis. But I guess out of the two, the one that is less likely to cause very severe allergy is probably the AstraZeneca, but a lot of reactogenicity, just not severe allergies at the moment. 
But um, we, you know, I think if you have the vaccine in a controlled setting, with under proper observation, with people aware that you have severe allergies and you've got the adrenaline on on site, and that should be the case anywhere that you get the vaccine anyway, then I think it's it's reasonable to go ahead with either. We've had quite a few severe allergic reactions to the Pfizer vaccine here in Tasmania, but we've reviewed all of them and only one true anaphylaxis so far. But some of the other allergies have been a bit concerning, I have to say. And so um, we're just watching this very closely. And there's a really fabulous um, program of monitoring going on in Australia through what's called Ausvac Safety, which is run by NCS. And um, they have, it's not started in Tasmania yet, but they um, are following up lots and lots of people by, um, by sending them text messages and they send back and if they've got symptoms, they then fill in the little form. It's all very well um, coordinated and they are reporting their data on the, I think it's on the TGA website every week at the moment. You can go and have a look at that. And again, it's reporting all this reactogenicity. Um, which is what we kind of expected. Did you particularly have a reaction to um, oh, antibiotics? Um, there's only one antibiotic that I can actually have that's safe for me. So would that come under, it would be safer if I had AstraZeneca? No, as I said, what we're saying is if you um, if you get called up for a Pfizer vaccine, you just give that allergy history and you would be watched for longer and probably put somewhere separate where people could just monitor you and keep an eye on you and just ca in case you got a reaction. It would, I mean, I don't think there's any antibiotics in either of these vaccines, but you would just need to check that you don't have an allergy to any components in either of the vaccines because that's obviously key. Oh, firstly, thank you for your talk. A very complicated uh, situation. One of the pro one who hasn't been spoken about. How much does anti-vaccination uh, cause a problem to uh, controlling the disease? So, look, I think our biggest single risk of not controlling COVID is the anti-vaccination sentiment, or just vaccine hesitancy. So, you get a cohort of people that are bona fide anti-vaccination and you're unlikely to change their minds. But you have an awful lot of people who are vaccine hesitant. And the reason for that is misinformation, confusion, lack of trust, all of those things. And this is why things like this are really important. Just hearing somebody and being able to ask questions and getting straight answers really helps people to understand what, what the whole picture really is. So our biggest risk actually is that group of people if they could then go on to refuse vaccine. And we're getting at least a 10% refusal rate in Australia at the moment, even among all our healthcare staff at our hospitals, our major hospitals, 10%, mainly young female nurses actually, are refusing to come in and have a vaccine, which is a real shame because this is a vaccine that will protect them from dying, also protect them from taking it home to their loved ones. It, it's not very logical, but it's what people do when there's not enough good, solid information out there. And of course, the internet is causing a huge amount of damage because all this misinformation just circulates and, um, and people get very afraid. And I understand the fear, but it's really important that we get the vaccines out to as many people as possible. Last week, my sister from Melbourne, I got a phone call at three o'clock in the afternoon. She had the AstraZeneca vaccine. Mm. And now they had her sat there for half an hour. Mm. No one asked her whether she had this day or whatever. And they just about saved her life because she was an they found out that she's anaphylactic. Her throat closed up completely and they absolutely panicked. They had three ambulances there with her. Yeah, well, I think if you listen to my talk, I've made it very clear that every vaccine in the world causes anaphylaxis. So there's a one in a million chance of any anaphylaxis from any vaccine. We know it's a recognized side effect. But if you're talking about a world that's dying of COVID and long term comorbidity and hospitals overwhelmed and medical staff dying, 
then you know you have to weigh up the risk benefit unfortunately some people are going to have anaphylaxis so i've dealt with one as well in tasmania from the pfizer vaccine they will cause severe allergic reactions rarely in some people now it's awful to hear that she was it wasn't picked up quickly and um but you know all over the world I've told you how many millions of doses are being given, tens of millions of doses. Not a single person has died of anaphylaxis from either vaccine because anaphylaxis is treatable and it's reversible. Of course, if you don't catch it, it wouldn't be. But that's why they keep people and monitor them because almost all cases occur within that 30 minutes. So <clears throat> I think your rationale for refusing the vaccine on the basis of that is not a very sensible one. The other thing you say, oh, I heard you're wearing that broadcast. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and you said it on two occasions and this by the way was on city park radio and i heard you clearly say that the medical staff were getting the pfizer vaccine uh, as against the astrogenica so what's the story there the story there is that the government set up pfizer hubs in various parts of the country by hospitals or within hospitals because they needed minus 70 storage Minus 70 storage is something that GPs can't do, rural areas can't do. And so they set them up there because these are very unstable vaccines. These RNA vaccines, as I was explaining before. And so that's the requirement. And because the phase 1A is hospital staff and border and quarantine staff, it was decided that Pfizer hubs in the hospitals would administer them. So it's not just hospital staff, it's all phase 1A that are getting the Pfizer vaccine just because that was the first vaccine that came out. And in fact, at LGH and um, at the Northwest Regional and at Royal Hobart, the top of the list was actually the um, all the border and quarantine staff, some of the police, et cetera, that would transport people who would come into the country because we felt that was the highest risk of all, getting people into the country and then bringing COVID in. Once they were all done and working through, they then started working through the frontline hospital staff only. So not all staff, only those that work on COVID wards, work in the ED and work on the ICU. And this is when we only had Pfizer. So AstraZeneca obviously came a little later and was only rolled out and started last week. That's a vaccine that the GPs can manage in their vaccine fridges. And so GPs are now getting quantities of that vaccine to start working through the phase 1B populations. And so with the Pfizer, there's only 20 million doses coming into the country over the whole year, but that's not guaranteed and never was. And in fact, what we were promised has not been coming. So the supplies have been highly limited. And I can say that at LGH, in the first two weeks, well, the first five weeks of the program, we got about 500 doses over five weeks. So um, the border and quarantine staff was, was nearly all of those. So very few LGH staff got it up front. But it, I absolutely following what I, we, the government strategy is, 1A and who those people are, they're all the ones who are getting the vaccine. Professor Cody Flanagan, that was a brilliant overview of a very, very complex subject, but most importantly, a very, very important and relevant subject to all of us, uh, particularly those of us who are over 80. Uh, so uh, uh, we're very grateful for you to give up your time to come and talk to us and explain in detail the uh, development and the progression and the rolling out and the future plans for this vaccine. And uh, we would like to, uh, give you a memento of your stay here. It's a little table map, Thanks. little certificate with the history of the oh, society on behind. And look, I, I hesitate to give you a book, book prize because I can't imagine a book a gift because I can't imagine how you're ever going to have time to read it oh with the amount of reading and research and organizations that you're involved in. But perhaps you might uh, oh, get it. Certainly. But uh, thank you very, very much. And uh, it's been a great, great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. The program for next week, and I would do urge you to pick up uh, the year's program on 
at, at the front desk uh, if, if you haven't already seen it. But of course, it is on our website. Uh, it's a complete program, and as I said before, stimulating and interesting, I'm sure you'll find. Our next guest speaker is Dr. Christine Hansen, who is going to tell us the stories of Kanamaluka, our Tamer River. And that couldn't be more topical or controversial and uh, uh, in the news at the moment. Uh, so that will be our next uh, lecture here, uh, 1.30, Sunday the 25th of April. And uh, I invite you and uh, all of your friends to come and listen to Dr. K K Christine Hansen, who is well, uh, well qualified to talk about this very, very popular issue. Uh, for any of our visitors or anyone else that has not know there's a pamphlet on the history of our uh, society that you can have a quick look at, uh, collect on your way out if you would like. Uh, I would like to say that uh, I'm uh, stepping down, of course, I've finished up my two year term as president. It's been a great honour and a great pleasure. I'm sorry that I couldn't uh, do as much as I should have because of illness. And again, I thank David Morris and all of the committee. Uh, it's great to see that they are all put their hands up again, with the exception of Jonathan Morris, who's got a very heavy study load. Uh, and uh, it's great to welcome a new committee member, Dr. Lois Beckwith, uh, to, uh, to the committee. I trust you all have a very safe trip home. I would urge you to look at our website to keep up to date with the centenary program because not only have we got a very good lecture program for you this year, but also it is our 100 year celebrations and there will be uh, coming online as uh, the details are finalized, uh, various ac additional activities beyond the usual lecture program. So do keep an eye on it. There'll be a lot of good things coming down the line. Safe home, good luck and all the best.